was, critics said, a preposterous idea. An outrage against South Dakota's Black Hills. What Eric and Stonecover could possibly improve upon God's mountain sculpture. But as the faces of the great men sprang like light from the mountain, Rushmore simply overwhelmed its critics and dazzled the world, just as the Republican ideals that armor had inspired and dazzled mankind in 1776. The project was conceived by a gentle scholar, Don Robinson, in 1923, at a time when the nation was prosperous and cocky. Robinson proposed that several granite spires in the Black Hills be carved into massive human figures. Lewis and Clark, Buffalo Bill Cody, Chief Red Cloud, or other Western heroes. To the sculptor he called upon for help, Guts and Borglum, this idea seemed as bold and brilliant and as fragile as a rainbow in the western sky. The son of Danish immigrants, Borglum was a man who dreamed big and talked big, a man ideally suited to the times and to the carving of mountains. American art ought to be monumental, he said, in keeping with American life, and Rushmore ought to be colossal in keeping with American achievements. Borglum found the needles impressive, but too weathered for sculpting. Mount Rushmore, however, seemed perfect. Stone with a finer grain and texture. A mountain big enough for Borglum's imagination. Borglum argued that a monument on this scale should represent our entire national experience. His final concept would be a tribute to the founding, preservation, growth, and development of the nation. These events would be symbolized by the images of four Americans who never lost sight of the simple idea that man has a right to be free and to be happy. Washington, Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln. Jefferson had articulated the central idea of the American democracy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, he wrote in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. More than 20 years later, when Jefferson became president, the red-haired Virginian also proved to be a great nation builder. His purchase of the Louisiana Territory in 1803 opened the way to America's westward expansion. George Washington was the father of his country. In the darkest hours of the revolution, his courage and resolve seemed never to falter. By sheer force of character, he brought the nation victory in its war of independence. There were some who wanted to crown him emperor, but Washington would have none of it, choosing instead to nurture, in his own words, the sacred fire of liberty. As our first president, Washington set about to make the lofty ideals of the Declaration of Independence work in practice. For his iron rectitude, for his inspired vision of the future of a free people, and for the dignity he brought to the office of the presidency, Washington will be remembered for as long as men dream of freedom. The great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, guided the destiny of the nation during its greatest trial, the war between the states. Let us have faith, he said, that right makes might, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Lincoln was the prophet of America's permanence and of liberty, tolerance, and social justice for all our people. <laughs> To political freedom, Theodore Roosevelt extended economic freedom. He was the daring trust buster, passionate conservationist, and friend of the common man. 
At a time when the U.S. was emerging as a world power, he led the march toward new frontiers, forging new links between east and west of the Panama Canal. We, here in America, hold in our hands the hopes of the world, he wrote, and shame and disgrace will be ours if, in our eyes, the light of high resolve is dimmed, if we trail on the dust the golden hopes of men. The mountain was dedicated August 10, 1927. The symbol of the moment was a set of drill bits handed to Portland by President Calvin Coolidge. With his customary showmanship, the sculptor put them right to work on the face of the mountain. For guidance in his design of studio models of the presidents, Borglum studied photographs, portraits, and life maps using the sculptor's tools of light and shadow to create likenesses with human character and vitality. Ninety percent of the monument was carved with dynamite. The silver stone was cracked and soft. Nearly half a million tons of rock were removed to reach granite solid enough for sculpting. <laughs> an engineer had suggested the use of dynamite to work them on an earlier job. By the time the artist came to Rushmore, he knew how to remove exact amounts of stone with each charge. To enable local hard rock miners to act as assistant sculptors, Borglum employed a measuring system called pointing. A circular plate, marked off in degrees, was mounted on the head of the studio model. One end of a bar was attached to the center of the plate. From the bar, a plumb bob was lowered until it touched the model. Measurements made on the model were multiplied by 12 and transferred to the mountain by the use of similar but larger devices mounted on the sculpture. Marks were made at each point, telling workmen how much stone to remove. Holes were then drilled for dynamite charges. The pointer was the most important worker on the mountain after the sculptor himself. In addition to pointers, the construction crew included powdermen, winchmen, blacksmiths, call boys, and as many drillers as the budget would allow at a given moment. During most of the construction, the workers hung over the side of the mountain in bows and chairs, a swing seat and harness. With their jackhammers and other equipment, the men were raised and lowered by cables attached to winches. It was customary to blow off the morning's work at the noon lunch break and the blast again at 4 o'clock when the ship ended for the day. The drillers became so skilled, they could block out a nose to within a few inches of the finished surface, shape the lips, and grade the contours of the neck, cheeks, and brows. As they approached the final surface of the sculpture, the drillers carefully honeycombed the rock with holes two to three inches apart. With the granite thus weakened, steel wedges were used to chisel off sections. The remaining pot like drill marks on the faces were removed with a small air hammer and facing bit, a finishing process called bumping. They left the granite as smooth as a concrete sidewalk. The Washington Head was unveiled on the 4th of July, 1930. In 1936, President Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke of the permanent importance of Mount Rushmore at the dedication of the Jefferson Head. 10,000 years from now, if you can meditate and wonder whether our descendants, because I think they'll still be here, what they will 
think about us. And let us hope that at least they will give us the benefit of the doubt. That they will believe that we have honestly stood in our day and generation to preserve for our descendants a decent land to live in and a decent form of government to operate under. In 1941, as a final dedication was being planned, Guts and Borglum died, leaving his son Lincoln to close down the work. When he first arrived in the Black Hills, Borglum was 57. Until his death, 17 years later, Rushmore had been the focus of his life. He is all but an impossible dream. Both its conception and realization, Rushmore is uniquely American, proclaiming bold ideals and big aspirations, celebrating the spirit of our people and the sweep of our civilization, reminding us of the hope a democratic society offers to the future. It is a monument no less to the men who, working together, transformed a lofty dream into a colossal reality, a work of art for the ages. A monument's dimensions shall be determined by the importance to civilization of the events commemorated, Borglum had said when he began. Let us place there, carved high as close to heaven as we can, our leaders, their faces, to show posterity what manner of men they were, then breathe a prayer that these records will endure until the wind and rain alone shall wear them